Galatians chapter 5, and this morning I invite your attention to verse 19, and we'll read on down to verse 26. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. The other day, Sister Faye gave me a stack of Bible programs, Bible conference programs from years gone by. And I love those old programs. Uh, in fact, I've got a stack of them at the house. You know, there's uh, the, the stack that she had, different than the stack I had. And a few of them overlapped a little bit, but... Uh, but I love those old programs. And I love looking over them and thinking about the subjects and considering the things that were preached and thinking of them and looking them over. There's one that caught my eye, a subject in there. It was from a 1991 Bible conference. I believe it was uh, preached at the Grace Baptist Church. Gladwin, Michigan, and it was preached by Brother Joe Wilson. The topic was proper attitude towards heresy, heretics, and heretical churches. I shortened that down, but I'm going to preach that this, this morning. Proper attitude towards heresies. Now, y'all didn't know I was going to preach that this morning, but um, what a great conversation beforehand, talking about the Pentecostals and some heresies that were discussed before church. I wasn't there when Brother Joe preached this message in 1991. He probably did a better job than what I'm going to preach this subject. Had I been there, I probably wouldn't be able to remember what he preached anyway because 1991 was the year I was saved and I was only 10 years old. So I probably wouldn't remember it even if I was there when he preached it. But as I thought about that subject, I thought, now what a great subject that is because a lot of, there's a lot of misunderstandings about heresies and heretics. There's a lot of times a couple things will happen when, when, when the subject comes up. First of all, somebody, a couple brethren, will disagree a little bit on a subject and one side or the other will cry heretic or heresy. And right away, and that's not necessarily the case. So that's number one, that sometimes we get wrong. <clears throat> the second thing 
that I think we get wrong sometimes is that some preachers in some churches, especially in the day and age that we live, are afraid to deal with heresies in a biblical fashion. And so we want to look at this biblically. What is heresy, first of all? Heresy is a little... It, it, first of all, heresy is not a difference in opinion over, for instance, if, if a church has a different color of a songbook, or if, 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 if a couple of brethren disagree on the timing of the rapture, or Genesis chapter 1, or 1 Corinthians 11, okay? It's a little bit deeper than that. And I trust that we'll be able to see that as we get into this message. Heresy, I believe, by definition, is a fundamental error in religion or an error of opinion respecting some fundamental doctrine of religion. The scriptures being the standard of faith, any opinion that is repugnant to its doctrine is heresy. Barnes notes, in, in, and that's Webster's 1828 Dictionary, by the way. Barnes notes quotes Webster definition of heretic being a person who holds and teaches opinions repugnant to the established faith or that which is made the standard of orthodoxy. So when we get into something like the Trinity and the subject that was being talked about a while ago, some of these groups that are saying things like that there is no Trinity. That would be a heresy. Just as an example. Um, from our text, we see that heresy is a work of the flesh. It's listed right here with such sins as adultery, murder, and drunkenness. Over in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, oh, and by the way, we can see the seriousness of this because when it comes to the works of the flesh, what does he say about it? Here in our text, not only does he say it once, but he says he's repeated it in verse 21. That last part. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Beloved, there are some things out there which even in our present day world have come to be accepted as mainstream Christianity, which are not. Things like Arminianism. Folks, that is heresy. It was not always that it was accepted as mainstream. That is heresy. And we've got to understand these sorts of things. It is a work of the flesh and not of the spirit. Well, we won't take a lot of time this, this morning. However, I've got a few points I want us to consider. First of all, God has given us the preventative to heresy. What is the preventative? If you want to jot down some notes, that's great. Um, what is the preventative of heresy? Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 
2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The best way to prevent heresy is to avoid it. That should be our desire. Now how in the world do we avoid it? Through the pure preaching of the Word of God. This is why ever since this church was established, ever since it was organized 25 years ago this year, there has always been Bible preaching that has happened in this pulpit. There have been things that perhaps have been preached here that maybe not everybody dis that not everybody agreed with. However, I believe that we can agree that this church has never fallen into heresy. And this is because the Word of God, the Word of God has been preached and upheld through these years. The Word of God is what should be preached and will be preached, the Lord willing, until the end. Preach the Word. That's what Paul demanded from Timothy as he wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit. And this is what has been demanded of all of the Lord's churches ever since. In 2 Timothy also in verse chapter 2, in verse 15, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. In our studies, we must rightly divide the word of truth. Truth is narrow. One plus one is always two. However, just because one plus one is always two, two plus two is always four, four plus four is always eight, just because you know that those, all of these have that one correct answer, guess how many wrong answers there are? There's lots of wrong answers. And if, you, if you've ever worked with children, you know there's plenty of wrong answers out there. And as they're learning and as they're growing and as they're trying to figure out math, they're going to put down all sorts of different wrong answers. As a teacher, as, as, the, as the one who's trying to show those children the truth of math, you don't have to learn all of the wrong answers, do you? All you have to know is the right one. That's what you have to know. And so it is spiritually. Listen. You can wear yourself out. Trust me. When I was, when I was a teenager, I got so worn out. I thought that I had to know about all the different religions. And man, I was learning about the, the Hindus and the, the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Catholics and the Presbyterians and the, and, and the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and, 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 and the Methodists. And on and on we go. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Now if you've got a friend who maybe is involved in something, you want to know a little bit extra about it, you can do some homework about it. That's, that's fine. 
But understand something, if, 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 the, if the cult leader knocks on your door, that's pre-2019, 2020, never mind, they don't, they don't come knocking anymore. They'll, they'll call you on the phone or send you a letter. You know, they don't want to, in six feet distance and all that sort of thing. But if they, if they approach you, whatever the case may be, don't panic if, you, if they give you some name of some religion you never heard of. What does the Muslim need? He needs Jesus. What does the Mormon need? He needs Jesus. What does the Pentecostal need? He needs Jesus. What do all these people need? They need the pure Word of God. That's what they need. That's what they need. Point them to Christ. Point them to the truth. Rightly divided. Hear me now. There are some things in this Word that you and I, we take for granted. Because we've been Baptists either a long time or we've been raised in the Baptist church for all of our life, for most of our life, we take some things for granted that seem so simple to us. Maybe we might even think of it as common sense. But they never heard it. They never heard it. Take them to the Word. Don't be afraid of that. As long as we stick to the Word of God, this will prevent us from falling into heresy as well. Because let me tell you something, so much heresy in this world comes not from malicious intent, but rather it comes from being derelict in our studies or in the pulpit. You neglect proper study, try to take shortcuts, Get lazy in, in, in this study. And even now, some pastors are lazy in the study. Studies have been replaced by offices or, or game rooms or television. The library's not there anymore. They got the big old big screen TVs now. What are they doing? I just get on Google and find my sermon, right? I just download my sermon from this place or that place. That's a dangerous thing to do. But whether somebody comes in intentionally with a bag full of heresies or whether unintentionally because they're lazy, both are dangerous. And the Word of God, the Word of God is the preventative. In Acts chapter 17, in Acts chapter 17, in verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. I love this verse, Acts 17, 11, and, and, and and, and I love to see a church that is Berean in this sense. Some folks look at this and think that the church is the preventative of error, but understand, it's not the church that's the preventative to heresy. Understand something. If you look at a church that has a pastor versus a church that doesn't have a pastor, Let's just use Unity Baptist Church in Winston-Salem. They don't have a pastor yet. They're as prone to heresy as any other church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many heresies have been born in the pulpit. Understand this. But also many heresies have been born in the pew too. So what's the key to Acts chapter 17 and verse 11? The key is the Word of God. That's the key. Sad to say it, but there are churches out there who have either, have either allowed or brought in error or heresy because they have not stayed 
true to the Word of God. That's the key. This is the preventative. The Word of God. The minute that we drift off the pages of this book, we're on a slippery slope where we could end up anywhere. Anywhere. And that's why the Lord only has one church. But in this world, there are countless churches. Countless denominations. Countless variations. And sub-denominations. Why? Because the, someone somewhere drifted off the pages of Scripture. They're treating it like... Treating it like a... Uh, a buffet. You know, so we pray. We pray for, ch for churches. We pray for Unity Baptist Church. We pray for this church. We pray for other churches of like faith and order. Secondly, what, what do we do with the heretic? After all, isn't that the subject of the sermon? Proper attitude towards heresies? And heretics, what is to be done? Well, in Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. It says, A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Well, we get excited about that first part, don't we? A man that is a heretic. The way we read this is a man that is a heretic reject. But that's not the way it reads, is it? A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. We're supposed to admonish the heretic. You want to get into some uncomfortable situations, hear me now. That means that we have to give the heretic time to explain himself. Time to explain himself. You want to know what that's like sometimes? That's like David going out to face Goliath on the battlefield. That's what that's like sometimes. Because some of these guys are awfully sure of themselves and are ready to fight anybody who comes after them. But they need to be admonished. They need to be admonished. Because, number one, maybe... Maybe we misunderstood. Maybe we misunderstood what we thought they said. Perhaps it's not heresy at all. Maybe it's just a matter, matter of miscommunication. You understand that there's two reasons why I record my sermons. Number one, because I pray that they're helped to other people. And perhaps even to those who hear me the first time, they all can go back and listen again. And maybe they can be helped uh, in obedience to the Great Commission. But also, number two, if there's some 
issue that comes up. David, I heard you say this in this message. Without a recording, it could become a it, be, it could become a crazy argument. But I have had to go back and listen. Sometimes the person who calls me misheard and I can clear it up pretty easy because I can say, hey, here's the recording, go back and listen to it. Other times I can go back and listen and say, well, I know that's not what I believe. Let me listen to it. I can go back and clear it up. Because then the other thing that happens sometimes is maybe the preacher did say something that was wrong. Either intentionally or unintentionally. Whichever way it was, we want to bring out and make sure that we present a solid biblical argument I know that sometimes we cringe at that word argument. I'm not talking about arguing like sometimes a husband and wife might argue with each other over, over whatever. I'm not, I'm not going to give examples that might get me into an argument later. But, um, but you know, <laughs> you know, I'll just leave it at that. You know, I'll just leave it at that. The neighbors, yeah, the neighbors. Sometimes the neighbors will argue about things. No, an argument just means that whenever you present an argument, it means you're presenting a case, a defense. Nothing wrong with a good discussion over the scriptures. Um, the Baptists of the 1800s, they used to have some good debates and discussions with people they disagreed with. Sometimes even with each other. Oh, I'm against conventions and, 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 uh, and, and all, all of those sorts of things, but one of the things that we've lost is the churches used to get together and subjects would come up and they would discuss those things. Sometimes they get pretty heated, but they were good to have those kinds of discussions. And they'd walk away friends most of the time. <laughs> most of the time, I say. But sometimes even those Baptists of days gone by, they would have debates with Methodists and Campbellites and all sorts of things. I don't think we ought to go out with a chip on our shoulder always looking for debate and argument. However, however, we ought to always be ready to answer questions. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, in 1 Peter chapter 3, And verse 15. <clears throat> but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready always to give an answer. That Greek word is apologia. That's where we get our word apologetics. Apologetics at its core is a logical defense of the faith, the truth of God's Word. We live in a, in a, in a grand communications age where everybody has a platform. Everybody has a, 
a pulpit, as it were, in order to present a message. Just ask anyone from the 13-year-old kid to the President of the United States. I mean, we've got Twitter, Facebook, blogs, YouTube. We've got it all in, in our world. Very easy to get a message out. Big or small, fact or fiction can be published on the internet with relative ease. And in the Bible we find that God's people by example and by command we are to give and be ready to give an answer, a defense of God's word. We ought to be ready to give a defense when, we, when, we're, when we're up in the pulpit uh, preaching God's word. We ought to be ready to give a defense when we hear God's word. We ought to be ready to, to stand up for God's word as God's people. That's what I'm trying to say. To be bold enough to ask a question if there's something that is disagreeable. It might be uncomfortable. But look, look. Paul, when he was in Athens, he got into the disagreement there with the Athenians and Marcio. He didn't get into a fist fight with those folks. He didn't kick or scream. He had a reasoned discourse. He presented his case for the resurrection. We have Facebook. Sometimes Facebook and, and, and Twitter and all that, we lose sight of the humanity of people. And I see sometimes people are disagreeing, sometimes good Baptist brethren even disagreeing over things. And before you know it, I mean, they're getting into knockdown, drag out fights, calling each other heretics and stuff. And, and what's, what's the issue? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're arguing over who wrote the book of Hebrews, you know. I mean, crazy things. Let's not be like that. But what we should do is we should admonish those who fall into, into heresy, into actual, uh, actual heresy. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes there are some things that we may disagree over, some things that aren't quite so clear, but there are some things that, that are clear, you know, like the Trinity. Uh, like the sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, in the book of Acts chapter 24, verse 14, we've also got to realize that sometimes when we preach the truth, we may be accused of heresy by heretics. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 24, verse 14, He says, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Paul. Paul was accused of being a heretic. Uh, falling into heresy. But we read his writing. We read about him. We know that he had not gone away from the standard of faith. But what he had done was he had gone away from the opinions of his Jewish brethren. Okay? So understand this, that sometimes when we're preaching and teaching the truth, we may be accused of heresy. Many times in Baptist history, you'll find the Anabaptists were accused of going into heresy and being heretics. In fact, many of them lost their lives being accused of heresy. Why? Because they baptized believers. Because they, 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 they preached the things that we preach. So understand this. The standard has to be the Word of God. It has to be the Word of God. 
And, 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 and understand also that we can't be so afraid of the term that we'll do anything to get out of it. But what of, what of someone who has actually fallen into heresy? What of someone who has really drifted away from the orthodox teaching of Scripture? When I was a young preacher, I'm talking about, I was probably 17 years old, 18, something like that. I've only been preaching about three, four years old, or three, four years. Oh, that, was, that would have been wild if I was preaching at three or four years old. But I'd only been preaching for about three or four years. And there was a Baptist preacher who, uh, who went. Uh, he had come from the Armenian side. He had, he, he had joined up with Landmark Sovereign Grace Baptist. And, um, and he hadn't been with, with us for very long. But he wasn't, he wasn't so grounded in Baptist truth. And the guy started reading some Reformed literature. And of course, the Reformers, we agree with them on the doctrines of grace. But he wasn't grounded, grounded so well in the subject of baptism. And so he went off on baptism and started following after infant baptism and things like that. So he fell into heresy of that way. What do we do with that? What happens when someone falls off on that? Well, of course, like I said, we admonish him two or three times. But what if he doesn't return? You know, and praise God, sometimes people do come back. The Holy Spirit gets a hold of them through the preaching of the Word of God, and they come back. But what if they don't? Titus 3, 10, 11, A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Such a one is to be rejected. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, says it this way. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they are such, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, we have these words, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed, it, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And then 2 John, verses 10 and 11, says, if there come in it any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. What do we do? Well, there are some men who I believe to be saved men. But they have grabbed hold of some heresy and they won't let it go. And because of that, I won't have them preach in the pulpits where I pastor. And I believe the church agrees with me on these things. We sit down and talk about it. Again, I'm not talking about a matter of disagreeing over the timing of the rapture. I'm not talking about a disagreement over the elements of the Lord's Supper. Now understand, understand what I'm saying here. I believe these are important topics.
But I wouldn't call those disagreements heresies. I believe there's something deeper with heresy. When, when we look at what a church is and what what Baptist distinctives are, okay, let's just put it that way. When we talk about what it means to be saved, when we line those things up, When you alleviate, or when you deviate, I should say, when you deviate off of that, that's where we start to get a problem. If you're trusting in works for your salvation, you're falling into heresy. If you're preaching works for salvation, you're preaching heresy. If you're, if you're preaching that you can go off and start your own church without without having authority. That's heresy. If you're if you're if you're if you're preaching that babies need to be baptized, not only have you gone away from Baptist doctrine, but now you're you're teaching works for salvation, right? If you're pulling your doctrine, what is doctrine? Teaching. From anywhere besides the Word of God. Terracy. Terracy. When when we get into this heresies, you notice that nowhere in the Bible does it give us a list of heresies. Right? It doesn't give us a list that says, hey, if you, if, you, if, you, if you believe this doctrine, it's a heresy. If you believe this doctrine, it's a heresy. If you believe that doctrine, it doesn't do that. But I believe what we find within the scriptures is there are some things that um, that we that we read and we study, and as we as we look at this, we say, all right, we can agree to disagree on this particular issue, but that that's a heresy, and we will not we will not have anything to do with that. <clears throat> God has given us His Word. 66 books of the Bible we've been given. By the end of, the, by the end of this inspired Word of God in Revelation chapter 22, down towards the bottom, Verse 17, 18, and 19. He says this. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things which are written in this book. And then he closes out. Verse 20 and 21, he says, He which testified these things say, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 
I believe that, yes, this has to do with writers, Bible translators, that they should not be adding to the Word of God. But it also has to do with preachers and teachers. And when a man gets up in the pulpit and says things like that a, man, that a person ought to be praying for the dead and things like that, that is adding to the Word of God. That's heresy. That's heresy. There's nowhere in the Bible that says anything of the sort. It's not a, a disagreement over the Bible. They've done set sail away from the Bible. Plain and simple. And as Paul said in, to the church of Thessalonica, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man have no company with him. Or as John put it, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. Oh, beloved, I believe that means inviting him into our churches. I believe that means even turn him on the TV. Be careful of the preachers we listen to on TV. There's some garbage on some of that stuff. Watch out. Watch out. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Now somebody says, all right, Brother David, so you won't have him to preach. You won't have these guys come preach. You won't fellowship with the heretical churches. You won't have the heretics come preach where you're at. You believe that some of them may be brothers, that's fine and dandy, but what happens? What's a church to do if their pastor falls into heresy? Understand something. No pastor is exempt from falling into heresy. I'm not exempt from it. Y'all pray for me. Understand it. Understand what I'm saying. I'm just a man. None of you out there are exempt from falling into heresy. But what's a church to do if a man falls into heresy. That's their pastor. What are they to do? Perhaps, again, maybe he has no malicious intent. Maybe he's fallen and bumped his head. Maybe he's got a brain tumor. Maybe, maybe he's just getting old and his mind's not what it used to be. What is he, what's the church to do? First Timothy chapter five. First Timothy chapter five, verses nineteen and twenty. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Let me put it this way. Titus chapter 3, 10 and 11, and 1 Timothy 5, 19 and 20. I believe these are applicable verses for a church where there is a pastor who has fallen into heresy or is falling. Admonish him. Admonish him. Uh, in fact, in fact, there in 1 Timothy 5, 1, he says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. That admonishment comes first 
before the accusation, before the, and there must be two or three witnesses and all that sort of thing. But understand something. If he won't be admonished, if he can't be convinced, if he won't leave of his own accord, preaching heresies, he is subject to the church. A church can discipline a pastor for sin, same as they can discipline anybody else. And they should. They should. I mean, look at those works of the flesh that we that we read about in the first in, in, in our text. Adultery, drunkenness. You wouldn't want a pastor that's running around on his wife. You want a drunkard as your pastor. Shouldn't want an adulterer or a drunkard as a member of the church. For sure you don't want a heretic in the pulpit. Oh, but Brother David, he's been our pastor for years and years and years. Listen, folks, the truth, the truth is too important. The truth is too important. Can you imagine if Joe Biden was in the, in the shape that he's in with his mind, if he was a pastor somewhere? Trying to trying to sort out biblical things. That'd be a disaster, wouldn't it? He needs to go home and, and and live out the rest of his years with his family. Let him go. Let him go, you know? Bottom line is, if there's a pastor falling into heresy, either the pastor leaves or you leave. That's the way I would look at it. If I were in a church with a pastor who was in heresy. And then, and then uh, I'd like to also say, be encouraged. You say, how in the world can you be encouraged when there's heresies? Well, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 17 through 20, towards heresy ought to be with with we should, we should have some encouragement in this and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 he says in verse 17 now in this that I declare to you I praise you not that ye come together not for the better but for the worse for first of all when ye come together in the church I hear that, that there be divisions among you and I partly believe it for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. You know, Paul is rebuking this church, this, this Corinthian church. He says, uh, I don't praise you when you come together. You're not coming together for better. It's worse. Can you imagine being a church? And hearing from the Apostle Paul, and he says, when you meet, it's not for better, it's worse. You'd, you'd be better off not meeting at all. That, that's essentially what he's saying. That's, that's a horrible thing to say to a church, but that's what, that's what he's saying to them under inspiration of the Spirit. And then, and then as he goes on, he says, I hear that there's divisions among you. Verse 20 he says, when you come together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. I, I know that's what, what you say you're doing, but that's not what you're doing. But look at that verse 19. He says, There's there must be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. There must be. Let me tell you, God is sovereign over even the bad things that happen amongst the Lord's churches. God is sovereign over even the bad things that happen in your life and in the life of the churches. And so when heresies spring up, be encouraged. But also be encouraged to know that when these things happen, there's going to be some disappointments because some brethren are going to fall for these heresies. Some friends are going to fall for them. 
carried about with wind of doctrine as they come up. But, and by the way, there's also going to be some who won't stand. So, that, so there'll be some who, who won't necessarily fall for the heresy, but there'll be some who try to ride the fence. They, they won't stand for the truth, but they won't fall either. They'll just kind of float along, and that's disappointing too. But there'll be some men who'll be made manifest among you. There'll be some who'll stand. That maybe you wouldn't have noticed had there not been these heresies spring up. Oh, I would say to those who would be on the fence and those who stay quiet during these times, that I would encourage them to go back and read Charles Spurgeon in the downgrade controversy. Go and read about, uh, about J.R. Graves and some of the things that he got involved in. Or go and read some of the old Baptist examiners and those guys. Or how about Paul? <laughs> There's a lot of examples we could get out of the uh, out, of, out of the New Testament, but Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Verses 11 through 14. He says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before this certain came to James, came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We're told by some of this generation not to say nothing against nobody and for sure don't name names when there's a heretic among us, but or when somebody goes into error. And Peter did something that some people would consider a small thing. Okay? Peter withdrew and separated himself depending on the crowd. Whether he was eaten with the Gentiles or whether he wasn't. Now, some people would say, oh, that's just a small thing. That's just a small matter. Don't worry about it. Let him do what he's doing. But like Spurgeon observed, small errors are the seedlings from which gigantic heresies spring up. And Paul withstood him. Had he let it go, Peter may have carried that on into something worse. You see. For every error, for every heresy, there's bold men like Paul who are willing to stand. We must stand. We must be bold on the truth. What is the remedy then as we bring this to a close? What is the remedy for the heresy? 
What is the remedy for the heretic? Well, we've come full circle. Because you see, the remedy for the for heresy, the remedy for the heretic is exactly the same as the preventative. It's the word. The word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Second Timothy chapter three. We get verse thirteen. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. And has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scriptures given by inspiration of God. Did you catch that? All Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The American dollar may lose its value. The Russian, whatever that thing is, it sure lost its value. The yen, it's losing its value. Even cryptocurrency is losing its value. But listen, folks, the scriptures, oh, it never loses its value. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You don't need anything else. It's all you need. It's all you need. Let us preach, study, read, believe His Word. Our only rule of faith and practice. Inspired from beginning to end. That is what we need in this day and age that we live in. The better we're grounded in the truth, the better we're prepared to stand against whatever kind of heresy may come. Whether it knocks on our door, whether it comes up on the television, blows in through the internet, or shows up in the church, wherever it's at. God's Word has everything we need. Whether it's an old heresy that's revived or a new heresy that comes up, it doesn't matter. We have everything we need right here in His Word. May God add the blessing to it. Thank you for your attention this morning.